If you have your Bibles, let's turn to the book of Hosea in the Old Testament, in the Minor Prophets, as we launched our series that we're doing in this season of Lent, a study in the Minor Prophets under the series heading, Loving the Wrath of God. I picked it because I thought it would hold our attention. Um, and we're going to do a study of the Minor Prophets uh, through that idea. And this morning, we're going to teach out of the book of Hosea, the prophet of amazing grace. And I'm going to read Hosea chapter 2, verse 23. The Lord says, Then I will sow her for myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people, and they shall say, you are my God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day that you have set aside in the order of creation for us to have a Sabbath rest, to come before you and acknowledge you and worship you and set aside all the affairs of this life to fix our eyes upon you. I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of your word that you would speak to each heart here, that you would enlarge our hearts, that you would mold our hearts and shape us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray this to the glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I said in the study that from week to week we would reinforce the seven points for why I can convince you that you will love the wrath of God. So we're going to just quickly go over that again that we launched into last week and why we could understand that it is such a necessary, a good thing. So real quickly, by review. Number one, I love the wrath of God because in it, he makes all things right. Secondly, because I do not want to take any of my sin with me into eternity, nor anyone else's sin. Thirdly, I love the wrath of God because God's wrath is contained in His mercy. Fourth, because without wrath, there is no justice. And because without wrath, there are devils forever. I love the wrath of God, number six, because of the cross. And number seven, I love the wrath of God because without wrath, we cannot understand God's grace. So the more that we understand, the more we're aware of our depravity, the more we will love God's grace, His mercy, His goodness towards us, the more we will cling to God above everything. God's wrath is a way of describing His absolute enmity against all wrong and His coming to set things right. And we will expound on that in the weeks ahead just to help us to realize just how under things we really are. So in this story, in this book of Hosea, in the opening verses, Hosea is told by God to marry a harlot. Verse 2 of chapter 1. Go, take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry or spiritual adultery by departing from the Lord. So Hosea goes and he finds a woman whose name is Gomer. And she is a harlot. And he marries her. And they have three children. And God tells him who, what names to give to them. He says the first one's name is Jezreel, which means destruction. And the second one's name is Lo Ruhama, which means no mercy. And the third child's name is Lo Ami, which means not my people. 
God specifically says that in those verses where he's naming them. And he says, call her name Lo Ruhama, for I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel. So God's telling him exactly what to do. Name your kids destruction, no mercy, and not my people. Now, just to play with this a little bit, can you imagine Gomer going to the market with her kids? And there's four-year-old Jezreel ripping open boxes of cereal, and she says to him, stop that destruction. Naming your kid destruction is a pretty strong message. Some of you who have four-year-old boys might want to change their names to destruction. Or Loami is throwing a fit in the shopping cart, and you look at the faces of the other people in the market and go, not my people. Mm -mm -mm, not my people. Or you're at your wit's end with the middle child's disobedience and you are ready to give them a whipping and you say, no mercy is your name and no mercy is what you're going to get. Some commentators try to soften the action of Hosea in taking a prostitute for a wife, saying, no godly person, let alone a prophet, would do that. It would be repulsive to all their moral sensibility and repulsive to the people around. To give us a sense of that, what if I wasn't married, but I was the pastor? And I go down to a strip joint, and I find a girlfriend, and I bring her to church, and I set her on the front row right next to me, dressed like a stripper, and then I marry her. Would that be offensive to anyone? I think it would. I'm pretty sure you'd come up to me and tap me on the shoulder and go, what are you doing? And I would have to say, just following the Lord. It's a crazy scenario, but a very powerful picture that God is painting. The Lord is acting on a picture of Israel and its relationship to him. Israel has played the harlot. She seeks after other gods. Chapter 2, verse 2 says this, Bring charges against your mother. Contend with her, for she is not my wife, nor am I her husband, says the Lord. Let her put away her adulteries. But even after Hosea marries her and bears these kids, Gomer leaves him, and she returns to her adultery. And so Hosea 3, verse 1 says, Then the Lord said to me, Go again. Love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel who look to other gods to love. Hosea seeks out his wife, who is now the, in the possession of a, another man, um, like a pimp. And he buys her back. He redeems her. Not once, but again. And brings her home. Notice what we read. The Lord tells Hosea, love a woman who is loved by another and is committing adultery. It's not just buy her back and have nothing to do with her. It's love her who doesn't love you. Love her who does not want your love. Love her who wants the love of everyone except the love of God. Now, Gomer, the harlot, is unfaithful Israel. And in this, Hosea is the Lord. God is acting in a most scandalous manner. We would be shocked by the action 
that God is behind all this. But he is. So I ask, why would God submit himself to this? And we begin to see a picture of God's great love, his emptying of his own reputation, his humility in order to possess the love of his creature. You better believe Hosea humbled himself, emptied himself to go after this woman who was unfaithful to him all the way through. Who can do such a thing? God's love is shocking. And his grace is scandalous. You just might be getting grace if you can't handle it. You might be getting near to it. It's too good. The grand theme of the Old Testament is this. Our need for deliverance outside ourself. That's what the whole Old Testament is speaking, especially in the prophets. We need deliverance, and we're not going to get it from within. We cannot pull it off. We need it from outside ourselves. We need someone to redeem us. We need someone to buy us back. But we are all under the realm of sin and the flesh and the devil. We are all under the domineering sway of powers and principalities that are hell-bent on keeping us under them. They are greater than us, more powerful than us, and they keep us under their sway. One commentary as I was looking into the book of Hosea, the commentator wrote this, Hosea began preaching in times of great prosperity when he began pronouncing judgment. The nation was at the summit of its military prosperity, but at the same time in a fatal moral decline. Internal feuds were happening everywhere. Rival politicians sacrificed the nation's interest to their own. Conspiracy was the key word of the history of this period. All classes of society became demoralized. Family life was being broken up. Religion was sinking. Men everywhere were pitted against each other. And the man who wrote this commentary on Hosea wrote it in 1926. He was describing the days of Hosea, which were written in 700 B.C. Sounds like it could be written for our day, doesn't it? So in understanding these prophets, as we look at them in these weeks ahead, the prophets need to be read on three different levels. The first level is the overarching cosmic realm, the, the realm of the heavenly principalities, powers, and the overarching storyline and the thing up above all of us. That's the first. And yet, we also have to read the prophets in the second one, the immediate historical realm, because they are speaking immediately to a people, to a nation, to Judah, to Israel, and, and about the Assyrians and about the Babylonians, and, and in real life, in real time, they're going to experience something. And the prophets are speaking about, in the realm of the personal. In the first realm, God is acting in the unseen heavenly realm. He's confronting the principalities and powers that rule over mankind and whom mankind is completely under their evil sway. God's wrath is saved for them, those powers. Those powers make things like politics an idol. An idol that manipulates our emotions and causes discord and rivalries and hatreds and fear. 
we think we don't have idols today. I think we do. That's the overarching realm. Secondly, God is acting in events in real time, in the historical realm. The northern kingdom of Israel is going to be judged and carried off by Assyria, and it will be a devastating thing upon them. They will be scattered and never brought back together. And that looks like wrath. But God has a bigger plan for Israel, which we'll see. And third, God is speaking to each one of us individually. He is wanting us to know the condition of our own hearts, how vulnerable we are to idols and to use religion and religious activity to justify ourselves. Now we know that the northern kingdom called Israel was carried off in 720 B.C., never to return, and was scattered into the nations. But listen to God's plan. Hosea chapter 1, verse 10, reads like this. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There it shall be said to them, You are sons of of the living God. And in that verse that we opened up with, then I will sow her for myself in the earth. Catch that line. God says, I will sow Israel, who I'm going to scatter in the earth for myself, and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people, and they shall say, You are my God. In verse 10, God is repeating his covenant that he made to Abraham in the book of Genesis, which in essence is God has a plan, and I will sow her for myself in the earth. This thing is going to happen that I have in mind, says the Lord. But this language also shows up in the New Testament. Where does it show up? Well, I think it's fascinating because in Peter's first epistle, he writes this. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Hear this. Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Peter is using Hosea's promises and saying they are being fulfilled. God's wrath is turned into his redemption. And in this book of Peter, he opens it up Hold on to this. He opens it up and says, To the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. He's, he's got the same dispersion going on, and he says, Now you are the people of God. Peter knew the book of Hosea, which is why he's quoting it to them in their circumstance. Where else does it show up? It shows up in the book of Romans in chapter 9. Paul writes, as he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and her beloved who is not my beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they, there they will be called sons of the living God. Paul is using the promises of Hosea. God was not finished with the story of unfaithful Israel. In Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, it says this, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Who else says this? 
Jesus. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 9. Then as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. And so it was, as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Get the picture. I love that picture. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. And now he's going to quote Hosea. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Who is Jesus after? Who is Jehovah after? The God of the Old Testament and the New is one and the same, and He is after sinners. He is calling sinners to sit with Him at His table. And Jesus says, to those Pharisees, and he says to our own Phariseeism, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. As I reflect upon this, it looks to me like the moment we put ourselves above others, think of ourselves as better than others, judge others is the moment Jesus will start using language like that toward us. Hosea is the prophet of amazing grace because God is the God of amazing grace. Never forget, he saved a wretch like me. So God's wrath is the revealing of our sin. And God's wrath is his enmity against all that gets in the way of his love for his creatures. And God's wrath is against all that stands against his redemptive purpose. His wrath is not an emotion like we conceive of it. It is God's Intervention on behalf of those who cannot help themselves. Who are these people? The answer is all of us. None of us can help ourselves. That's the storyline of the Old Testament. Now here's the truly fascinating part of the story of Hosea. Hosea was pulled into God's own pain and suffering and sorrow. He was living it out in marrying Gomer. He was pulled into the sense of unfaithfulness and indignation. Don't you think he felt that himself? And he was pulled into God's invincible and unconquerable love. Hosea felt all these things. God's faithfulness to Israel is stronger than Israel's unfaithfulness to him. God is making Hosea like himself. So in Hosea 14, the last chapter, says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger is turned away from him. Know this, God is after the backslider. Never give up on anyone. God has a way of getting to us. The hound of heaven will track down the one who flees from him. 
That's why I never get upset when someone walks away. Oh, God's not done with them, even if they think they're done with God. The good shepherd will not rest until he has found his lost sheep. The good physician will go after those who are sick and dead in sin. I overheard Deb the other day repeating something that she said to quite a few people, and this is what it was. She said, we are now the body of Christ. Us, you and me. We are Christ's extension in the earth. When someone receives our love, they are receiving the love of Jesus. Your love for them is holding them in the hands of the Lord. You, of course, are not saving them. The love of God is saving them. And God is working through you. But conversely, if what you extend to others is disdain, or hatred, or no compassion, or no hope, then you are not acting as the body of Christ. You do not yet know the scandalous nature of his love for you or for others. You do not yet have the scandalous nature of God's love in you for others. But God will take the whole of your life to build that into you. That's what God's doing with us. Hosea, like all the Old Testament prophets, did not sit outside of the sinful nation, but identified himself with his people in their sin. He sorrowed over their calamities as though they were his own, and repents for their sins as though he had committed them himself. This is what God has done for us. So let us ask this of ourselves. Do we accuse people before God? Or do we call out their name before the Lord and pray, show them mercy and kindness? Do we express our frustration and anger and resentment towards those who do not align with us Or do we call out their names before the Lord and pray for goodness and grace for them? Do we put ourselves on the side of the good guys and all who disagree with us are on the side of the bad guys? Of course we do. Or do we call out their names before the Lord who seeks out the sinner and the backslider, and the lost. Jesus, who sat among the cheats and the prostitutes, says to us, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. God's amazing grace is put on full display in the Old Testament under Hosea. Now, I want to take this time as we close up to show a video that Donnie Berry showed a clip of a few weeks ago. Now, he just showed about a minute's worth, but I'm going to show the entire scene. And in the entire scene as we watch it, Jesus has an encounter with two women. One is caught in adultery, and the other, a worldly-looking woman, a harlot, I think Mary Magdalene. Now note while we watch this scene how Jesus stoops below the woman caught in adultery. He doesn't stand over her. And note how he invites the worldly woman to come with him. To where? Well, he's going to the temple. In John's writing in the gospel in chapter 8 of this encounter with the woman caught in adultery, John very specifically says, Jesus kneels down, Jesus stands up and speaks to the Pharisees, then he kneels down again, and then he stands up and forgives the woman. He does this very intentionally. 
For those who are watching online, you need to click the link so you can watch this three-minute clip. And for those of us here, let's give attention to it. Our God stoops below all sinners that he may lift them up. God wants us to know his heart and live in the ways that he lived as he walked the earth. 